Bismillah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. وأفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وفقها في الدين يا رب العالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, We continue إن شاء الله our series of studying the lives of the great uh, four imams الأئمة الأعلام the uh, four imams that lead the uh, jurisprudence by their thoughts and their school in our uh, religion as a uh, Muslims that follow the sunnah of the Prophet And I would like to remind ourselves why we do these things, why are we studying the lives of, of the imma, uh, the imams of, uh, of our madhahib, of our schools of thought and, and, and schools of jurisprudence. It is to really understand how much of role models they were how they uh, not only were jurists and told us what, should, the, the, what is halal and what is haram, what is allowable, what is forbidden, but also they were role models for the Muslims. And uh, we know that uh, ourselves and our youth always need, we all need to remind ourselves that we have great examples in our religion, people that uh, were great examples in every aspect of life. And if you look at all the lives that we have been study, studying before and going over, and, and there is a role model for every uh, talent. There is a role model for every direction that somebody wants to take his or her life into. We studied how uh, people that have uh, great ambitions, how the uh, leaders uh, emerged from, around, from the Sahaba and how they led the Ummah to uh, one of its most glorious times and how uh, we uh, studied the, the military leadership, the educational system and uh, how the Muslim Ummah became the beacon of light for what is known in the Western world as the medieval time or the Dark Ages. And that is the time when Muslims carried the banner of civilization for the entire uh, human, human race, for entire humanity. And these people were in the forefront of that. And it is important for us to understand their lives, how they grew up, what their ambitions were, how they led themselves, how they conducted themselves, and how they reached what they reached uh, in the, in, to get to the pinnacle of knowledge and uh, understanding of our religion. And alhamdulillah, we have uh, uh, finished a short series of the life of Imam uh, Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, uh, who is the, uh, for the Imam of Madhab al-Hanafi, the Hanafi school of thought. And we also studied the life of Imam Malik ibn Anas, Imam Dar al-Hijra, rahimahullah, who is the Imam for the Maliki Madhab. And we get to study uh, the life, inshallah, of one of the great Imams, a very uh, important figure in our Islamic history, and that is uh, Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, he uh, was the third of the four great Imams in the time uh, where he appeared. And this uh, slide here, just to help us understand the, the timeline, if you see on the bottom here, this is the years in Hijri. The first one, like we studied, was Abu Hanifa, who was born in the 80th year after the Hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and died, rahimahullah, in 150th year after the Hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Imam Malik uh, was born in the 93rd of the uh, year of the Hijrah after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's Hijrah, and then he died uh, at the 179 uh, year after the Hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Our uh, Imam today, Imam Shafi'i, was born the same year that Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, died. He was born in the 150th year of the, after the Hijrah of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we know Imam Shafi'i never met Imam Abu Hanifa, but we know there is really a continuum connection between these great four great Imams. Imam Malik met with Abu Hanifa, but they were... Uh, they briefly met in, in one of the visits of Abu Hanifa to Al-Hijaz, but they were at the same time. Their, their activities were almost in the same uh, time here. Uh, Imam Shafi'i, as we will study, uh, met for a long time. Actually, he was one of the students of Imam Malik, and Imam Ahmed was one of the students of Imam Shafi'i. So Imam Shafi'i was born in the year 150th 
after the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ, and he died young. He's really got the shortest life of the great four Imams. He died only when he was 54 years old, in the year uh, 204, after the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ. So who is Al-Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah? Al-Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, in his nasab, in his genealogy, in his tree, uh, family tree, he is from Quraysh. He's from the family of Quraysh. And he is not really far from the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-Imam al-Shafi'i, the, his, his nasab, he's Muhammad. His name is Muhammad. Ibn Idris, the son of Idris. Ibn al-Abbas. Ibn Uthman. Ibn Shafi'i. Ibn al-Sa'ib. Ibn Ubaid. Ibn Abd Yazid. Ibn Hashim. Ibn al-Muttalib. Ibn Abd Manaf. So he meets with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Abd Banaf who is the, one of the uh, great, great grandfather of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-Muttalib, if you remember when we were studying the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the seerah, Al-Muttalib is the one that brought his nephew Shayba uh, back to Mecca behind him on his uh, mule or camel. And as he was walking into Mecca, the Meccan at that time thought, that Al-Muttalib bought a new slave. And they started calling that boy, Shayba Ibn Hashim, they started calling him Abdul Muttalib. Because, and that name stuck with him. And actually he was not a slave of Muttalib, he was his nephew. He was uh, the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ. But the name Al-Muttalib, just to clarify this point, is not the, it's not the, uh, Abdul Muttalib. He is the uncle of Abdul Muttalib the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ. So Al-Imam al-Shafi'i belongs to this family of Bani Abd Manaf. And this is the, the clan of Quraysh where the Prophet ﷺ was born into. So he is the closest of the four Imam in his genealogy to the Prophet ﷺ. And uh, why is he called a shafii he is actually in his time, and you will see that referenced in many historical books, he has always been called uh, a lot of times Al-Muttalibi. Al-Muttalibi based on his uh, uh, relative predecessor Al-Muttalib. So he's called the Imam Al-Muttalibi. But he always liked to be called a Shafi'i. Because Shafi'i, one of his great grandfather, he was a Sahabi of the Prophet ﷺ. And actually the father of Shafi'i was also a Sahabi, a Sa'ib. So Shafi' ibn Sa'ib was a Sahabi of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sa'ib himself, one of the great grandfathers of Imam Shafi'i, was a Sahabi, was a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he had a beautiful story about his Islam. He was captured with the prisoners of Quraysh when they were against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the battle of Badr. And at that time, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave them the option of either uh, embrace Islam or they have to teach 10 Muslims how to read and write, or they can pay money to ransom themselves out of, of uh, being prisoners. And as Sa'ib uh, ransomed himself, he paid money to get himself out of uh, imprisonment uh, as a prisoner of war, and then he declared himself a Muslim. Then he embraced Islam. So the Sahaba said, why did you do that? He could have just said, La ilaha illallah, you don't have to pay anything. And he said, I, I, I knew the Sahaba, the companion of the Prophet ﷺ, were in a state of poverty. They were in need for that money that I wanted. And I, I hated to deprive them from it. So I wanted to pay my ransom so they can have it, they can use it. And then I also wanted to become a Muslim. And he became a Sahabi. And then his son, Shafi' is the one that was uh, basically embraced Islam. He, that's his son. Embraced as, as a youngster. So he was raised... As a, as a young Sahabi with the Prophet ﷺ. And that's why an Imam Shafi'i loved to have his name attached to that particular person. But his uh, family genealogy, is, this is, uh, it's related to Al-Muttalib, Ibn Abd Manaf. So sometimes you will see him, uh, people refer to him as Al-Muttalibi, uh, to the Al-Muttalib. But uh, most, uh, the most famous title for him is definitely a Shafi'i. Uh, as related to Shafi' ibn Sa'ib radiallahu anhum ajma'in. The clan of Al-Muttalib is close to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's family. And there is a story about the, you see the, the, the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a Hashimi. 
is from uh, Bani Hashim. And Banu al-Muttalib and Bani Hashim were very close, much closer than their relationship with Banu Abd Shams and Banu Nawfal. And one of the uh, stories that are reported in the Sunnah, the Nasirah of the Prophet وسلم, when Quraysh uh, made an embargo, an economical siege against the, the clan of Hashim, uh, as it is known as the uh, Hisar Shu'ab, Bani, uh, Shu'ab Abu Talib, when they were uh, besieged in the uh, fork, in a mountain fork of Abu Talib, and then nobody would buy from them, nobody would sell them, nobody should marry from them, and nobody should marry to them, then the clan of Al-Muttalib decided to go into the siege with their cousins, Banu, Banu Hashim. They voluntarily, and many of them were not Muslims, but they voluntarily, because of their closeness to that, to that uh, uh, clan of Bani Hashem, they decided to go into that siege with them. And it was a very hard situation, but they endured that in, uh, in a show of support to their cousins, the, uh, 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 the family of the Prophet ﷺ. And for that, the Prophet ﷺ rewarded the clan of, Abd al -Mut of, of Al Muttalib that when uh, the spoils of war were divided among the Muslims, he would give them the part of Dawil al Qurba, of those of kinship. And the, the verse of, uh, in Surah Al Anfal is how to divide Al Anfal, which are the spoils of war. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّمَا غَنَمْتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَإِنَّ لِلَّهِ خُمُوسَهُ وَلِلْرَسُولِ وَلِذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَكِينِ وَابْنِ السَّبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَلِلْرَسُولِ وَلِذِي الْقُرْبَى The people of kinship, the orphans, the poor, and then uh, the people who are in need, who are in, on travel and they don't have money and other uh, people in need. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa from that fifth of his, he would give to the family of Imam al-Shafi'i, to al-Muttalib. And the, later on the Khulafa, the uh, Khulafa of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa continued the same habit. And that's uh, at the uh, end of his life, Imam al-Shafi'i was receiving an allowance or a salary based on that particular verse because it's a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to honor the clan of Al-Muttalib in that particular aspect. So this is all to show how they were important uh, clan and important family to the Prophet ﷺ. And uh, it is uh, narrated from uh, on the authority of Jubair ibn Mut'im that he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he uh, told him, he said, أَعْطَيْتَ بَنِي عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ وَتَرَكْتَنَا And you have given uh, them that clan and you left us without uh, money and they are in the same. And then uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِنَّهُمْ لَمْ يُفَارِقُونَ فِي جَاهِلِيَّةٍ وَلَا إِسْلَامٍ إِنَّمَا بَنُوا هَاشِمْ وَبَنُوا عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ شَيْءٌ وَاحِدٍ And he tied his hand together like this. He said, these two families are one thing. And he put his hands together and, and showing of, of how close these two clans are. So the point is that the Shafi'i is from the uh, Quraysh, it's from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is not directly a descendant of the Prophet or his gra grandfather, but he is, uh, his great-grandfather is an uncle of the great-grandfather of the Prophet, is a brother of the great-grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is his family. Al Imam al Shafi'i was born in the year 150 after the Hijrah of the Prophet. Now, although he's a Qurashi and Quraysh live in Mecca, the, the Quraysh clan lives in Mecca, but he was born in Gaza. He was born in Gaza, you know, the, the, the Gaza Strip, and I think anybody that uh, knows anything about the Middle East would know where that is. It's in Palestine, may Allah return it to the hands of Muslims. And uh, Gaza is at the uh, southern coast of uh, Palestine. And he was born in Gaza because his father, Idris, uh, was emigrated to Gaza uh, asking for, he was looking for provision, he was looking for jobs, and they were not a rich family. We know and many times that many clans in Quraysh were filled, there were people of honor, but not necessarily people of wealth. And Idris, the father of Imam al-Shafi'i, was not a wealthy man. 
and he uh, immigrated looking for provision, looking for, uh, fam for support for his family to Palestine. And then his son, uh, Muhammad, was born in Gaza. But shortly after the birth of Muhammad, rahimahullah, Muhammad ibn Dris al-Shafi'i, his father died. So his mother, and his mother was from uh, Yemen, from uh, the tribe of Al-Azd. And his mother found him herself a stranger in a strange land without any support, without the support of her husband. And there was no family, no extended family around her to help her uh, uh, with, with her life. And uh, here she is with this uh, little orphan. And she had to wait about two years until Imam Shafi'i was two years old to be able to return back to the, where the, the Shafi'i's family is and what that is in Mecca because traveling was very harsh at that time to travel from Palestine to Al-Hijaz uh, on the uh, camel's back and in this rough uh, terrain. It is hard on an infant and many infants would die from the journey. So fearing... Uh, for her uh, little infants, she waited for two years, and then she carried her son back uh, to Mecca so he can be raised among his family and his people. And the mother of Imam Shafi'i, like we saw the, the parents, and especially the mothers of these great Imams, always play a very important role in their upbringing. And the mother of Imam Shafi'i was a very smart, very shrewd woman. And it is reported in history some of the stories about her herself. And one of these things that they know how she was a learned woman uh, in the uh, matters of jurisprudence and the matters of Islam. One of the things that are reported on the mother of Imam Shafi'i, that she was called to be a witness in a case before a judge. And the, there were a man witness and two women uh, witnesses. And that would be sufficient in the uh, Islamic jurisprudence is to have two witnesses, two males or two males, and, or one male and, and two females. And the judge wanted, he heard the testimony of the man, and then he wanted to hear the testimony of the two women, and he wanted to hear it separately. He didn't want him to to testify with the other uh, women is present so that it would not influence their testimony, so there would not be any corroboration. And the mother of Imam Shafi'i said, no, this is a mistake. When, when we witness as women, we have to be together and listen to our testimony. And he said, how so? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, أَن تَضِلَّ إِحْدَاهُمَا فَتُذَكِّرَ إِحْدَاهُمَ الْأُخْرَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said we, the two women, so if one of them forgot, then the other one would remind the other woman about the testimony. He said, how can we remind each other if we're not together? The whole point of having the two women together is to remind each other if one of us have forgotten for one reason or the other. And the uh, judge stood corrected and he... Uh, showed that she had the right opinion and he had the wrong opinion. And that is one of the things to show that the mother of Imam Shafi'i was a learned, wo learned woman. She knew uh, jurisprudence and she was very, uh, she was a caring mother for the education of her son, for the upbringing of her son. And she dedicated her life to bringing an Imam Shafi'i in good environments and to give him the best knowledge and best education in Islam possible. Now, this is not an easy thing at that time. Remember, they're poor family to begin with. That's what took Idris, the father of Imam Shafi'i, to Gaza in the first place. So they're not people of wealth. And here now she is, the, the, support, the male supporter of the family with the rest of the family of uh, Imam Shafi'i, his uncles and others. But she is the caregiver for this orphan. And she is completely responsible for his upbringing. And she did very well. She directed, it her, she directed her son to seek knowledge of Islam. And from his young age, she put him in the halaqa to, remember, to know about his religion. And the first thing she taught him was Qur'an. And Imam Shafi'i narrated himself that he memorized the Qur'an when he was uh, less than 10 years old. And in some narration, by the seventh year, by his seventh birthday, he had already became a hafiz for the Qur'an. He already had memorized the entire Qur'an. And 
that uh, knowledge of Quran that he had in Mecca uh, stayed with him for a long time and he became his recitation of Quran is so beautiful that everybody narrates that when, the, when Imam Shafi'i would recite the Quran then everybody who would listen would cry everybody would be tearing as with his beautiful recitation and his good grip and hold on the Quran and she did not stop there radiallahu anha rahimahullah the mother of Imam Shafi'i she wanted to give him the key for all for acquiring knowledge and the key to acquire knowledge in any culture is to have a good knowledge of the language itself to have good grip on the language and the language of fiqh and islam and quran is the arabic language now he was in mecca and obviously he was raised among quraysh which are very good uh, arabic speaking uh, people and the quran was revealed and the language in the dialect of quraysh but she knew that the better language is not in Mecca. And we knew that from the life of the Prophet ﷺ. What did Amina bint Wahab do to Muhammad ﷺ? To teach him the best language possible, they send him out to the desert. They send him to the Arab tribes that had the purest language, the language that is not touched by the foreign elements that were entering Hijaz and the Arab world at that time. So their language was uh, very, uh, very strong and she sent them to the, to the Bedouins of Hudayl. She sent them to the uh, tribe of Hudayl and Imam Shafi'i, uh, subhanAllah, you see how much parallels between the life of Imam Shafi'i and the life of the Prophet wasallam. that both were orphans and here's the, the life of them, how they were raised. And he was sent, Imam Shafi'i, like the Prophet wasallam, to the tribes of Arabia to be taught the language of the Arabs, to learn the Arabic language. And he stayed in, uh, in the tribe of Hudayl to learn uh, the uh, Arabic language. And most narrations said that he st uh, stayed for uh, many years. And in there... In the family of, uh, who, in the tribe of Hudayl, he learned poetry. Because Hudayl was from the most poetic Arab tribes. So he, he learned thousands upon thousands upon thousands of the poetry lines. And the poetry, after he finished the Quran and he possessed that knowledge of Quran, and now he learned a lot of Arab poetry and a lot of Arab literature, he really had a, a very good grip on the Arabic language. So the, he was known for his own poetry. He was known as a poet, Al-Imam Shari. And by the way, his poetry is uh, very beautiful and very eloquent. And it's still, he's got a good collection that it's with us today. It's well documented. Inshallah, we will share uh, some of his poetry at the end of each, uh, each session that we do for Imam Shafi'i. But that was one of the things that he learned with Hudayl. Then when he finished his, learn, his education of the language with Hudayl, he came back to Mecca. Imam Shafi'i came back to Mecca, and at that time he had the, an excellent basic education to do whatever he wants to do with it. And as he came back to Mecca, he was known for his good uh, eloquence and good language, and he would sit around and he would give, he was in his teens, mind you, but he would uh, sit around and poetry is, was, was the entertainment of the time uh, at that age. And he would give people poetry and tell them about the poets and, and recite what he learned in Hudayl and tell about the stories of Arabia and etc. And people would gather around him and he would listen. They would listen to what he had. But one time, one of the Zubayriyin, one of the descendants of Zubayr ibn al-Awwam radiallahu anh, came by him and he listened to his eloquence and, and how he ha was given a talent in his speech and, and his presentation and all of that. And he said to him, he said, يَعِزُّ عَلَيَّ أَلَّا يَكُونَ مَعَ هَذِهِ الْفَصَاحَةِ فِقَةِ He said, I feel so sorry that you don't have knowledge of jurisprudence, knowledge of your religion with this eloquence that you have. فَتَسُودَ أَهْلَ زَمَانِكِ You would be a master in your time. You would be somebody in the future if you do that. So Imam Shafi'i was very touched by these, these words and he's the one that reported it. And this was a turning point that he wanted to learn more 
about his religion. So he uh, was in an excellent environment in the city of Mecca. There was Alim Mecca at that time, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, who, who was one of the great imams in our uh, jurisprudence and, and imam of, uh, of religion. And Imam Shafi'i went to his halaqa and went to halaqa of many others, like Al Imam, imam Muslim ibn Khalid al Zinji. And he stayed there learning the matter of jurisprudence and, and the matter of his religion. And we see that always these uh, little triggers that set these great imams on their way. We saw how Imam Abu Hanifa was just attending a halaqa where Imam al-Nakha'i so asked him, well, so what sheikh do you go to? And he said, I just go to the marketplace because he was a merchant. And he said, with all this shrewdness and intelligence and, and, and now you, you just don't come to... The, and, and he turned his life around to become a scholar. We saw how the father of Imam Malik uh, was quizzing his children about matters of jurisprudence. They waste no time. And how Imam Malik made a mistake and his brother knew the answer and his father scolded him and he said, you're too busy playing with birds than to learn the affairs of your religion. And he turned around the life of Imam Malik. And same thing happened to Imam Shafi'i when one of his uh, cousins of the family of Zubair ibn al-Awwam said that you have to take knowledge because you got the tools. You have the, the intelligence, you have the, you got the head for it, you have the tongue for it, and you have the character for it. And it is good that you should pursue that line. And Imam Shafi'i, uh, alhamdulillah, pursued that. And in his young age, he reached a very high degree of knowledge and, know, know, and, and knowing about his religion until his imam, who was at that time Muslim ibn Khalid al-Zinji, he gave him a, a, a sort of a graduation degree. He said, Afti ya Abdullah, ya Aba Abdullah, faqad ana laka an tufti. Give fatwa. You are now qualified to actually give fatwa, give rulings. And that is something that is very high in the matters of jurisprudence for, an, for a young person to reach that tells you how much knowledge he had and how much of an unusual characters, uh, characteristics that, that uh, he had, radiallahu anhu. And after he acquired knowledge in Mecca, he wanted to go to the cradle of knowledge. The cradle of Islam was in the city of Medina. We know how Medina was the capital of jurisprudence, especially at the time of its great imam, Imam Malik ibn Anas, Imam in Medina, Imam Dar al-Hijra. And Imam al-Shafi'i heard about Imam Malik, and, and Imam Malik was very famous at that particular time, and he wanted to go study under Imam Malik. So he went to the governor of Mecca. And he asked him to give him a letter of recommendation in our uh, in today's term to Imam Malik. So Imam Malik would accept uh, Shafi'i, Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i rahimahullah in his school, in his halaqa. So the governor of, Medi of Mecca, the Wali Mecca wrote a letter to the governor of Medina so that can be an intercession with Imam Malik. And the story uh, goes as is narrated in Mu'jam uh, Yaqut and Manaqib al-Shafi'i for al-Razi rahimahullah. He said, I took the letter to Wali al-Medina and to Malik ibn Anas. So when I reached Medina, I gave the letter to the governor of Medina. And then when he read it, when the governor of Medina read that letter and what, what he needs to do, he told the Shafi'i, Ya Fata, O oh, youngster, young boy, Young man, إن مشي من جوف المدينة إلى مكة حافيا راجلا أهون علي من المشي إلى باب مالك بن أنس. And he said, if I walk from Medina to Mecca barefoot on my feet, it's easier for me than to go and ask Imam Malik for 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 anything to be at the door of Imam Malik. فلست أرى الذل حتى أقف على بابه. I don't feel my humility. Unless when I'm in his presence. And we know how Imam Malik had a great presence and a great character. And even the governor of Medina would feel that he was little when he was in the presence of Imam Malik. So Imam al-Shafi'i said, أصلح الله الأمير إن رأى الأمير يوجه إليه ليحضر. Amir, the governor can ask Imam Malik to come to him. And 
the governor of Medina said, Hey, Hat, no, this is far fetched. Later, any the Rakibtu, Anna Wamai, wa Asabana, Minturabi al Aqiq, Nilna Baba Hajatina. He said, I wish if I can just show him how diligent I would walk through him and how dusted I was when I got to him, maybe he will have some mercy on me and he will give me what I want. So they went to the door of Imam Malik and uh, the uh, the servant of Imam Malik got out and uh, the, he, the governor was there and he said, tell your master that I am at the door, the governor of Medina at the door. So she comes back and she said, إن مولاي يقرئك السلام ويقول إن كان لديك مسألة فارفعها في رقعة يخرج إليك الجواب وإن كان للحديث فقد عرفت يوم المجلس فانصرف she's, This is talking to the governor and she said My master Imam Malik said that if you have a question then just write it on a piece of leather and he'll send you the answer But if you come to learn about the hadith of the, because Imam Malik was a muhaddith if you want to just learn about the hadith, then you know what time is the halaq, and you just show up at the masjid. You don't come to the to his door. So you can leave now. So this is how, how he's, you know, this is the, and this is not a story really to, for, to just to know the, how, what was the level of the alim, what was the status of the alim, of the scholar at that time. Imam Malik was above the wali was above the governor of Medina because of his knowledge, because of his ilm. So, uh, she, he said, the governor said, she said, tell him I have a letter from the governor of Mecca in an important matter. So after that, she walked in and she get, got out and she put the chair for Imam Malik and Imam Malik comes out. And this is how Imam Shafi is describing him. He said, إِذَا بِمَالِكْ قَدْ خَرَجْ وَعَلَيْهِ الْمَهَابَةُ وَالْوَقَارِ وَهُوَ شَيْخٌ طَوِيلٌ مَسْنُونُ اللِّحْيَةِ فَجَلَسْ He said, he came out and he had great presence. And he, the, he his character, his just appearance demanded respect. He said, he looked very respectful and he sat down. And then the governor gave him the letter. And then he read it. And that letter said that this is, uh, you know, Muhammad ibn Idris and he wants to join you and we recommend him for you to be in your halaqa, etc. So after he finished, he threw the letter away. He threw the letter and he said, Subhanallah, awasara ilmu rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yu'khadu bil wasail bil wasta. He said, even the knowledge of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now is taken with intercession. It's taken, you know, with connection. If you have a connection, you get the ilm. If you don't have a connection, you don't get it. He said, this is the knowledge of the Prophet wasallam." And then he said, the wali could not open his mouth. And Imam Shafi'i thought that he's going to lose his chance. He's being rejected from, from, this, uh, from the presence of Imam Malik. He said, Then I, I came to him. And he said, Aslahak Allah. إِنِّي رَجُلٌ مُطَّلِدِي وَمِنْ حَالَتِي وَقِصَّتِي He said, I, then I started speaking, I told him, I am from the clan of Al-Muttalib, and I told him my story, my, you know, my seeking of knowledge, and who I was, and all of this. And Malik had a great, what is known as farasa. He knew how to study the character of people. And then he started hearing the eloquence of Imam Shafi'i. He was a youngster at that time, and how he possessed uh, good presence and good language and good presentation. So Imam Malik liked what he was hearing and he said, Masmuk, what is your name? He said, Muhammad. And he said, Ya Muhammad, ittaqillah. Wajtani bil ma'asi, fa innahu sayakunu laka sha'n. Oh Muhammad, have piety, have fear of Allah, and then avoid the sins and you're, you will have, um, you will be uh, somebody of importance in the future. And that was the prediction of Imam Malik. And then he was accepted by Imam Malik into his halaqa. And he started studying under Imam Malik until, and he stayed in the halaqa of Imam Malik until Imam Malik passed. Until Imam Malik died, rahimahullah. And that was in the year 179 after the hijrah of the Prophet wasallam. At that time when the Shafi'i graduated, from the halaqah of Imam Malik, he was 29 years old. And it is not known exactly how long he stayed. Some references quote 10 years, some quote less, some quote more. But he stayed with him after he finished his ilm in Mecca until the death 
of Imam Malik. So one of the greatest students of Imam Malik is actually Imam Shafi'i. And they had a very uh, great relationship. After he finished, after Imam Malik died, Imam Shafi'i started looking what he wants to do with his life and what he wants to do, where he wants to go. And at that time, the governor of Yemen uh, was in Medina. And he wanted to take people to uh, put them as governors or uh, mayors of small towns, of towns in Yemen. And he was looking of people of knowledge and people of presence and people of piety. And a Shafi'i was recommended to the governor of Yemen. And that is the governor of the entire province of Yemen. So he took, he uh, offered the Shafi'i wilaya. He offered the Shafi'i to be a mayor of a governor of a city called Najran. The city of Najran in Yemen. And Imam Shafi'i accepted and he went to Najran to become uh, the mayor of the governor in Najran. So he actually practiced qada and practiced government uh, for that time under uh, the uh, Abbasid Khilafah, under the uh, province of uh, Yemen. And uh, he was... Uh, and, and, and he reported that. He said, وَلِيتُ نَجْرَانَ وَبِهَا الْحَارِثُ بْنُ عَبْدِ الْمُدَانِ وَمَوَالِي ثَقِيفِ وَكَانَ الْوَالِي إِذَا أَتَاهُمْ صَانَعُوهُ فَأَرَادُونِي عَلَى نَحْوِ ذَلِكَ فَلَنْ يَجِدُوا عِنْدِي He said that it was a, a lot of people of Thaqif and clans that are belong to, in support to, uh, to the clan of Thaqif. And every governor that would come to them, they want to get close to that governor uh, so they can uh, you know, take advantage of their closeness uh, to the hierarchy in the, in the government. And he said that they, they didn't find that with me. He was very just. He did not, uh, he did not preference, pe- had any preference for one clan over the other or certain people over the other. And he uh, was very uh, good governor according to the historical uh, uh, reports. But at that time, there was started a conflict between him and the governor of the greater province of Yemen. The governor of Yemen had a problem with Imam Shafi'i, and it is not known the details of that, but we know Imam Shafi'i was leaning towards the people of the house of the Prophet ﷺ. He was politically a supporter of the house of the Prophet ﷺ, and those are the descendants of Al-Hassan and Al-Hussein, the son of Ali, and Fatima radiallahu anhum ajma'een. And for that, uh, for that leaning, for that political support for those clans, and because of the problem with the governor, the governor wanted to get rid of Imam Shafi'i. And at that time, there was a conspiracy from the Alawiyin, from the supporters of the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi against the house of Abbas, who were the Khulafa at that time. And the governor of Yemen reported name of nine conspirators to Harun al-Rashid, who was the Khalifa at that time. And uh, he put the tenth, or one was of the ninth. It was a, there's a conflicting reports here whether the total number was nine or the Imam Shafi'i was the, was the tenth person. He put the name of Imam Shafi'i as a conspirator against the Abbasi Khilafa. So the, they were all arrested and they were sent to the court of Harun al-Rashid to be tried and to be punished for their conspiracy against the authority of the Khalifa. And the, uh, this, the site was reported in history. The scene of that trial was reported in history and it was a very uh, serious situation as the first conspirator would come before Harun al-Rashid, the executioner would be standing right there by that person. And when the interrogation is finished, then off with the head. And they were executed right there on the spot. And another person would come, and the head would go off. And a third person would come, and the head would go off. And the the last person before Imam Shafi'i asked for just a few minutes to write a letter for his mother and off with his head without any, uh, uh, you know, without any chance to do anything. And then comes the turn of Imam Shafi'i. And, and you can imagine what would be 
his psychological status at that time, how would he feel? I mean, no, you know, the, the knees would be weak, the tongue would be tied, and you know, it's it's a status, it's the state of, of utmost anxiety. But that was not Al Imam Shafi. And Harun al Rashid started asking him questions about who you are, who are you, what are you, what, why are you conspiring? He started the interrogation with him. And Imam Shafi said, Mahlan, hold a minute. Take it easy. He said, you are the one in the, in the position of authority. You have the power and I don't. You should be the one listening to me and I'm not, should not be the one listening to you. Because you can do whatever you want to do with me. And then he started telling Harun al-Rashid that this was all a lie about him and he did not conspire against the government and it was all because of his relation, bad relationship with the governor at that time and how he was uh, basically dragged into this by uh, falsehood, that he was not a part of that conspiracy. And at the presence of Harun al-Rashid in that same court, was uh, a great scholar who was Muhammad ibn al-Hasan. If you remember Muhammad ibn al-Hasan, he was a judge, he was a qadi. But he was one of the great students of Imam Abu Hanifa. He is actually the one that authored the six books of the Hanafi that the entire Hanafi madhab is based upon, upon the writings of Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hasan. And he had a great stature, great status in the court of Harun al-Rashid. And then Imam Shafi pointed at Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hasan. He said, Muhammad ibn al-Hasan knows of me. Muhammad ibn al-Hasan knows me. So Harun al-Rashid calmed down. He said he knew that what the one he's talking to is not an ordinary man. And he asked Muhammad ibn al-Hasan, and he said, is that, is that true? And he said, إِنَّ هَذَا مُحَمَّدِ بِنْ إِدْرِيس This is Muhammad ibn Idris, a Shafi'i. وَلَهُ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ حَظٌ كَبِيرٌ He's a great scholar. So even at that time, uh, Imam Shafi'i was known to be a great, and he was in his early 30s at that time. This incident happened in 18, I'm sorry, in 184. So Imam Shafi'i was only 34 years old at that time. So Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hasan knew that this Imam Shafi'i was a great scholar, even at this is relatively very young age. And he said, له من العلم حظ كبير. He is a great scholar. وليس الذي رفع عليه من شأنه. He said that the, this this accusations, this allegation is not of his character. It's not something that he would do. So Harun al-Rashid said, خذه إليك. Take him with you حتى أنظر في أمره. And, and until I see uh, about it. And then he asked Imam Shafi'i to give him advice. He knew and he sat with him and started talking to him. And then he uh, asked him to give him advice to Harun al-Rashid. And he started speaking with eloquence and, and talking to Harun al-Rashid about the, the religion and give him, uh, give him uh, preaching and maw'idah and reminding him of the hereafter until Harun al-Rashid started himself tearing. And then he gave him 50,000 dirham has a reward. Now he was coming to get his head decapitated and he goes out of the court with 50,000 dirham as a reward for his advice to Harun al-Rashid. And it is reported that by the time he got to the gate of the palace, he has already given away the entire uh, amount. He's already given the entire amount to the servants, to the uh, stable people, to the hijab, to the porters of Harun al-Rashid. And by the time he reached the gate of the palace of Harun al-Rashid, he had nothing with him. He didn't take anything away from that uh, except his life and his head. Alhamdulillah. So that was the uh, his encounter with political trouble. And subhanAllah, all the great full, four imams had frictions and had political trouble with the authority, whether they wanted or not. Even Imam Malik, who was so... Uh, he wanted to avoid any of that and his whole fatawa was against any uh, uh, problem with the government even himself he got into trouble with the government so it seems like it was the, the signs of that time that you really can't survive without being in trouble uh, politically with the authority but then that was 18, the year 184 after the Hijrah of the Prophet wasallam, And Imam Shafi'i stayed in Baghdad at that time. This is his first Baghdadi, first uh, period in Baghdad. And it lasted for two years. And in Baghdad, Baghdad at that time was uh, after, the, uh, after Imam 
uh, Malik died in Medina in 179, the entire weight of knowledge moved uh, heavily towards Baghdad. And Baghdad became the capital of knowledge. So Imam Shafi'i wanted to take advantage of that and he stayed to even seek more knowledge uh, with, uh, with the presence of a great Imam. And that great Imam was Muhammad ibn al-Hasan himself. Muhammad ibn al-Hasan was the, one of the greatest Imams of the Hanafi jurisprudence. Now you see how the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has directed the life of Imam al-Shafi'i. He was in Medina under Imam Malik, so he learned from the jurisprudence of Imam Malik. Then he moved to Yemen, and in Yemen there was two great Imams. One of them followed the Awza'i school, which was uh, a well-known school of jurisprudence, and the other one was the Laythi. And even during his presence in Yemen, he was seeking law knowledge from these schools. Then now he moves to Baghdad, and he found himself in the presence of one of the greatest Hanafi scholars, and that is Muhammad ibn al-Hasan. Muhammad ibn al-Hasan, like we said, he put the knowledge and the, the rules of the Hanafi school in his books. And Imam Shafi'i memorized the entire uh, books, the whole, uh, bo- the whole uh, volumes of Imam ibn al-Hasan, and he recited it upon Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hasan himself. So Imam ibn al-Hasan, it's like going into school with him and get a degree from the person that wrote the book himself. And Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hasan uh, gave him the, uh, the authority that he already have uh, the knowledge of this entire uh, the Hanafi school that Muhammad ibn al-Hasan possessed. So after that, he went back to Mecca. And Mecca is his, where his uh, basically family is. And he stayed in Mecca for nine years. And it is known that during these nine years, he had halaqa. And when he came to Mecca, his halaqa was one of many halaqas, many, uh, and, and these were really small colleges, small universities, if you will. I mean, don't think of a halaqa when we say a halaqa, a few people sitting in the corner of the masjid. These were schools that the imam was the dean of, and they would teach, and, and they have, te- you know, sub-teachers under them, and tutors, and etc., and he started in one, one corner of the masjid in his halaqa, and his halaqa was getting bigger, and every other halaqa was getting smaller. And it was narrated that there was about 50 halaqas at that time, and the biggest of it was the halaqa of Sufyan ibn Uyayna, who was the scholar of Mecca at that time. And by the end of these nine years, the halaqa of Imam al-Shafi'i was about the only halaqa that was left in the masjid, and it was the largest uh, by uh, of, of, of all the halaqas that was present in the Masjid al-Haram around the Kaaba. Sharrafah Allah. So Imam al-Shafi'i in his nine years in Mecca, he uh, continued to teach and he also continued to learn from the imams that were in Mecca, especially Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna. And at that time, in this particular period, from, 19, from uh, 186 till 195, the fiqh of Imam al-Shafi'i started crystallizing. Now he had such vast knowledge now of all the schools that were before him. First-hand knowledge of the Hanafi school, school, first-hand knowledge of the Maliki school, and he started forming his own school. And we will uh, go into that, inshallah, into more details. But one of the things that he achieved in that period, in this nine years in Mecca, that he started putting the rules for jurisprudence. Now, jurisprudence before Imam al-Shafi'i, they had sources and they had uh, fatawa, they had rules about certain matters that they know they have a method into reaching them. But these methods were not put like method one, method two, this is how you do it. There was no clear methodology before Imam al-Shafi'i came. And that is the major contribution of Imam al-Shafi'i, is to put categories, to put the methodology, turuq wa wasail, listimbat al-ahkam, fil fuqa. And that methodology of jurisprudence is one of the greatest contribution of Imam al-Shafi'i, and he started that in this period between 186 to 195, after the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How much time do we have? 
I have now. Uh, the, one of the things that were reported of that particular period of Imam Shafi'i that he became famous even at that, and, and this is an early stage now, in 195 he was 45 years old. And that is still somebody in their, in their really, in their peak, in their, in their most productive years, and he was still teaching and, and learning at that time. And at that time he became, uh, start, his fame started uh, going out. And it is reported uh, in Mu'jam Yaqut al-Hamwi that reported been, uh, from Ishaq ibn Rahawi. Ishaq ibn Rahawi was one of the great scholars of Islam. He said, we were in the halaqa of Sufyan ibn Uyayna. He's speaking about his encounter with Imam al-Shafi'i. And we were writing hadith. Sufyan ibn Uyayna was one of the great scholars of the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Ahmad ibn Hanbal came to me. And Ahmad ibn Hanbal was a young man who was visiting Mecca at that time to seek knowledge. So he came to Ishaq ibn Rahawi, who was his friend from Baghdad. And he said, Qum ya Aba Yaqub, hatta urika rajulan lam tara'inaka mithluh. Come, come up with me, I will show you somebody you have never seen the like of before. I will show you somebody who was great. So he said, I, I walked with him. فَأَتَى بِيَ فَنَاءَ زَمْزَمْ So we came around the well of Zamzam. And then we found a man. عليه ثياب بيض in, in white garment تعلو وجهه السمرة His, he was dark complected uh, Imam Shafi'i he was حسن السمت he was a handsome person حسن العقل he looked like he had presence and intelligence and then he let, made me sit next to him and then he Imam Ahmed already knew who this person was so he said يا أبا عبد الله, عبد, عبد الله هذا إسحاق بن راهوي he introduced him to Imam Shafi'i he said, فَرَحَّبَ بِي وَحِيَّانِي فَذَاكَرْتُهُ وَذَاكَرَنِي فَانْفَجَرَ لِي مِنْهُ عِلْمِ He said, the, the knowledge started pouring out of him. He said, I've never seen anything like that, uh, like this man. وَأَعْجَبَنِي حِبْضُ And then he said, I just didn't feel the time passing when I was with him. And then when we finished, I looked uh, to Ahmed ibn Hanbal and I said, then take me to that man you were telling me about. Uh, he said, I will show you somebody you've never seen the like of before. And he said, you are with him. This is him. He said, this young person, this is the one that you took me away from the halaqa of Sufyan ibn Uyayna to, to come to the halaqa of this young person. He said, I was sitting with Sufyan ibn Uyayna and he would say, حدثني الزهري عن نافع. He was telling me hadith from very high hadith. Uh, from a zuhri from the great tabi'een. And you brought me to this young man. And Imam Abu Hanbal said, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal said, Ya Aba Ya'atub, iqtabis minhu, take from him. فَإِنَّهُ مَا رَأَتْ عَيْنَايَ I have never seen the like of this man. And this was early on in the relationship between Ahmed ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah, and Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah. Now this relationship will develop more and more in the second period when Imam Shafi'i goes to Baghdad, and there will be a lot of visitation between Imam Ahmed and Imam Shafi'i, and a great mentor-student uh, relationship, and a friend-to-friend -friend relationship between these great two Imams. They were so close together, they were personal friends, and Imam Shafi'i worked as a mentor, wa alaykum as salam shaykh, as a mentor for Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. But Imam Shafi'i loved to travel. He couldn't stay in one place for a long time at all. He was a traveling person. He, and you will see in some of his poetry how much he loved to travel and how much benefit thought he thought of, of traveling to other places, interacting with new people, and learning new things. So he decided to travel again back to Baghdad. And that was in a hundred and 95 years after the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And at that time, it's still the time of Harun al-Rashid, uh, rahimahullah. So he wanted to go back to Baghdad and to uh, interact more with the knowledge that was in Baghdad. And his knowledge started maturing at that time. Now at that time he was 45 years old, and his school started crystallizing, and he knew he had a fuqah. He had a school. He had a school that is different from all the schools that he was interacted, interacting with before. It was different from the school of Abu Hanifa. 
And he was different from the school of Malik. And these were the two major schools that he was affected by, although he was very knowledgeable with other schools, like the school of Imam Awza'i and the school of Imam al Layth. And al Layth was a very, very uh, known faqih at that time. And the, the only problem with the Imam al Layth that he didn't have uh, many students under him that carried his fuqah. So that's why the fuqah of Imam al Layth was distributed basically and learned from the other uh, great Imams. But then Imam uh, Shafi'i decided to go back to Baghdad in uh, 195 after the Hijrah of the Prophet wasallam, and he started writing his most famous book known as Ar-Risala. The book is known as the Risala, the letter. And in that particular book, Imam Shafi'i started putting down the methods of his madhab, the rules of his madhab, the madhab Shafi'i. And he is the first to do this ever. He is the first person in our Islam, Islamic history, to put the rules of jurisprudence in a book. And that book was called Ar-Risala for Imam Shafi'i. And that's when he wrote it, but then uh, we need to understand that he wrote it twice. He wrote Ar-Risala Al-Qadima wa Ar-Risala Al-Jadida, the old Risala, the old letter, and the new letter. And the difference in time between them is not more than 10 years. But the Risala Al-Qadima or Risala in Baghdad, it's called the old Hanafi, uh, the old Shafi'i school. Al-Fuqh Al-Hanafi Al-Qadim. Because Imam Al-Shafi'i changed many things when he made his last travel and his last, last relocation to Egypt. And that happened in 19, uh, in, uh, I keep uh, adding another uh, <laughs> zero to these years, 199 after the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So by that time, he had already written his great, the great volume of Ar-Risala. And the story of that is one of his students, and his name is Abdul Rahman ibn Nahdi, wanted, uh, asked Imam Shafi'i for a letter. He said, I, I know uh, the jurisprudence, I know the hadith, I know the Quran, but I don't know how to derive the rulings. I need methods, I need guidelines. I need guidelines to help me in this. So Imam Shafi'i started writing this in Baghdad in, the, in this t- period of time where he was in between 195 and 199 after the hijrah of the Prophet wasallam. Then uh, after that, he uh, decided to move to Egypt. Now the scholars uh, discussed why did he decide to make this last move. One of the uh, things, and it's probably the most plausible explanation about why Imam Shafi'i moved again uh, from Baghdad to Egypt. And Egypt was not a capital of, of jurisprudence at that time. It really, the, the major uh, scholar that was in Egypt at that time, and, and he was uh, gone by, that, by, when the, by the time of Imam Shafi'i reached there, was Al-Layth ibn Sa'd, Al-Layth ibn Sa'd that we spoke of. But Egypt was mostly Maliki. So there is really nothing new for Imam Shafi'i to learn in Egypt. He already studied under Imam Malik himself. And he had the knowledge of Imam Layth. A lot of the scholars said the reason he moved was because Al-Ma'moon, because Harun al-Rashid died, and then there was this battle between Al-Amin and Al-Ma'moon, the two Khalifa, and then Al-Ma'moon won the Khilafah. Al-Ma'moon became the Khalifa. Now, what about the Ma'moon? Al-Ma'moon was a Mu'tazilite. He was a supporter of Al-Mu'tazila. And Imam Shafi'i and Al-Mu'tazila, at that time, they started targeting the scholars, the Imams that they disagreed with their school of thought. And they wanted, they started a new thing with the Ma'moon, that they wanted to force the Imams to follow their school of aqidah, school of faith. And they started capturing people, putting them in prison, torturing people, forcing them to follow their, it was a persecution, religious persecution. And many uh, scholars said Imam al-Shafi'i in anticipation of that, immediately when al-Ma'moon reached power, Imam al-Shafi'i decided to leave Baghdad to be as far away from the Mu'tazilite and as far away from the grip of Al-Ma'moon as possible, and he decided to leave to Egypt. Mu'tazila. 
Yeah, inshallah. The question is, would I explain more about the Mu'tazila? Inshallah, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Especially when we study the life of Imam Ahmed. Imam Shafi'i was able to avoid a lot of this conflict. But Imam Ahmed found himself immersed in it, in the middle of it. So inshallah, we'll explain that. I just don't want it to be repeated too many times. So Imam Shafi'i moved to Egypt. And in Egypt, he said... Uh, before he left, he, he said this famous poetry. He said, لَقَدْ أَصْبَحَتْ نَفْسِي تَتُوقُ إِلَى مِصْرَ وَمِن دُونِهَا قَطْعُ الْمَهَامَةِ وَالْقَفْرِ فَوَاللَّهِ مَا أَدْرِي أَلِ الْفَوْزِ وَالْغِنَى أُسَاقُ إِلَيْهَا أَمْ أُسَاقُ إِلَى الْقَبْرِ He said, I now am yearning to get to, I'm longing to, to get to Egypt. And before Egypt, there's a long way there while he was leaving Baghdad. And I don't know if I'm going there for wealth and richness, for uh, to be of higher status, or I'm going to my grave. And the scholar said all of that was true. He became more rich, he had higher status, and then he was buried in Egypt, rahimahullah. And in Egypt, in the year... Uh, two, uh, 204 after the hijrah of the Prophet وسلم, Imam Shafi'i died and his age was 54 years old. Uh, you see the difference, the, the striking difference in the lives between Imam Malik and Imam Shafi'i is in traveling. Imam Malik never left Hijaz. And Imam Shafi'i was all over the Muslim world known at that time, uh, known for knowledge. So he was born in Gaza, then he moved to Medina, then he went to the desert and he studied with Huzayl. Then after that he went from Mecca to Al Medina to study under Imam Malik. Then he moved to Yemen to become the mayor of Najran or the governor of Najran. Then the problems took him to Baghdad where he stayed between uh, 184 and 186 after the hijrah of the Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he studied the fiqh al-Hanafi then back to Mecca for nine years between 186 and 195 after the hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then back to Baghdad between 195 and 199 after the hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then finally to Egypt uh, 199 to 204 after the hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he died there and Imam Shafi'i uh, had his, the last, uh, 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 he authored his last books in Egypt and he wrote, rewrote the Risala, the book of Ar Risala, and that's one of his books. The other famous book is known as Al Um, the Mother, the book of Al Um, or the, the essence of things. And uh, that was also authored, and in this new Risala, he put his new fiqh, because he modified his position on many things. And that tells you the flexibility of Imam Shafi'i and how dynamic his fiqh is and still is, till today, and how adapting to the changes of life. Because life in Iraq was different from the life in Egypt, in Masr. And he ad adapted his fiqh, his school of jurisprudence, to, uh, and he modified many of that to the life that was in Egypt at that time. <coughs> Uh, next session, inshallah, we will study what made Imam Shafi'i who he is, his personal attributes, who were her teachers, his teachers and mentors, what were his life experiences that he went through to form him and to shape by the aid of Allah subhanahu wa taala, by Allah subhanahu wa taala to, to to tell him what he how he was and who he was, and then his time. One of the personal attributes, inshallah, we will touch on next time, his intelligence, the depth of his personality, his eloquence, his sincerity. And then we will study, inshallah, his teachers in Mecca, in Medina, in Iraq, and in Yemen. And also, how the school of Abu of Imam al-Shafi'i was really the middle ground. We studied the uh, life of Imam Abu Hanifa and how he was of the school of opinion what is called in our jurisprudence the Iraqi school. And then that was transmitted to a Shafi'i by Muhammad ibn al-Hassan. And then how he studied the Hijazi school or the textual evidence school and immediately and directly under Imam Malik and an Imam Shafi'i according to most scholars was the middle ground. Was the middle ground between these two schools. 
the school of Ar-Ra'i and the school of Al-Opinion. And Al-Imam Al-Shafi'i by that was one of the greatest scholars of our time, Rahimahullah. And inshallah we will stop here and entertain maybe any comments or any discussion. We have about five minutes. Jazakumullah khair. And if not, if there is no questions, I can share with you some of the poetry of Imam Shafi'i, if, if, if uh, that is uh, acceptable. So any comments? He died 54, 54 years of old. He was really young. Uh, it, most accounts say he, was, he died of natural causes. Uh, natural uh, causes. And uh, uh, one of the diseases that was reported is uh, excessive bleeding from hemorrhoids is one of the things. And they said that's just, you know, from the, the type of his life, his traveling, his sitting for long hours and all of that, and, and there was no remedy for that. One uh, weak narration said that he uh, was conspired against and he was beaten and then he died. But that is a weak narration. There is really the most, most accounts say that he died of natural causes. Uh, I would uh, just share some of the, uh, uh, of the poetry of Imam Shafi'i and all of his poetry was poetry of wisdom, was what's known as Shar al-Hikmah. قال الإمام الشافعي رحمه الله First I will say the whole thing in Arabic and inshallah I will try to translate it although translating poetry is definitely not of uh, my uh, stature for sure. Imam Shafi'i said وَإِنْ كَثُرَتْ عُيُوبُكَ فِي الْبَرَايَا وَسَرَّكَ أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهَا غِطَاءُ تَسَتَّرْ بِالسَّخَاءِ فَكُلُّ عَيْبٍ يُغَطِّيهِ كَمَا قِيلَ السَّخَاءُ وَلَا تُرِ لِلْأَعْدَاءِ قَطُّ ذُلًّا فإن شماتة الأعداء بلاء ولا ترجو السماحة من بخيل فما للنار فما في النار للظمآن ماء ورزقك ليس ينقصه التأني وليس يزيد في الرزق العناء ولا حزن يدوم ولا سرور ولا بؤس عليك ولا رخاء إذا ما كنت ذا قلب قنوع فأنت ومالك الدنيا سواء نام الشافعي سيد وإن كثرت عيوبك في البرايا وسرك أن يكون لها غطاء تستر بالسخاء فكل عيب يغطيه كما قيل السخاء He said if you are a man, if you are a person of many faults, of many uh, imperfections, of many uh, personality problems then cover your faults with generosity because generosity, if you are a generous person then that covers all of your other faults and this is one of the wisdom. If you know, a generous person is always beloved to people. It's always more tolerated uh, by people despite some character problems. And he said, "Wala turi lil aadai qatu dhulan, fa inna shamata al aadai balau, fa inna shamata al aadai balau." He said, "Don't show your weakness and your humility to your enemies, because that what you're gonna get from from if you show your weakness and humility to your enemies." is tribulation and you will be tested severely if you show that to them. And then he said, وَلَا تَرْجُوا السَّمَاحَةَ مِنْ بَخِيلٍ فَمَا فِي النَّارِ لِلْظَمْآنِ مَاءُ He said, don't seek generosity with a miser, with a stingy person. Because it is like you want to drink out of fire. You can never find quenching cold water in that. He said, leave the miser people alone, leave the stingy people alone. And then he said, وَرِزْقُكَ لَيْسَ يُنْقِصُهُ التَّأَنِّي وَلَيْسَ يَزِيدُ فِي الرِّزْقِ الْعَنَاءُ He said, your provision from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not be decreased if you were less, less, you know, you don't kill yourself over getting your provision. This will not decrease your provision if you took it easy on yourself in seeking that rizq, in seeking that sustenance from Allah. And if you kill yourself over, then that will not increase your provision from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So work just, you know, by balance, by moderation. And then he said, وَلَا حُزْنٌ يَدُومُ وَلَا سُرُورٌ no, Nothing is everlasting in this dunya. Not, uh, if you're sad, then don't think that this sadness and sorrow would last. And if you're too happy, don't be arrogant. And don't think that this is, you know, will last. Nothing would last. And then not even poverty would last and not even wealth would last. All of that, he said, all the conditions in the dunya are temporary. So don't get too depressed about it, and don't get too arrogant if you have 
a good uh, bounty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he said this final wisdom is culminated in this one line in poetry. He said, if your heart is content, إِذَا مَا كُنْتَ ذَا قَلْبٍ قَنُوعٍ If you are content with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, فَأَنْتَ وَمَالِكُ الدُّنْيَا سَوَاءُ You and the king of this dunya, the greatest king in this world, you are equal. If you are content with what you have. So we see this is uh, just a, a sample of the poetry of Imam Shafi, and I hope I did not murder it with my translation. It is really the hardest thing is to translate uh, such great words of wisdom. But the Shafi'i is known with, with his eloquence, and he is the only Im- great imam that actually had a diwan, had a collection of poetry. And uh, I would try to look for, for probably an English translation. And if somebody has it, please uh, forward it to me. And, and I would love to, to have that. Maybe we can share it with everybody. Jazakumullah khair. And uh, for that, inshallah, we will conclude with dua. Allahumma aghfir lana dunubana wa ifratana fi amrina. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana. Wa zidna ilman wa fiqhan fi ad-din ya rabbal alameen. Allahumma aghfir lana wa li ikhwanina al-lazayna sabakuna bil-eeman. Wa la taj'al fi qulubina ghillan alil lazayna amanu. اللهم اغفر لنا ولإخواننا لأحيائنا ولأمواتنا لمشايخنا ولأرباب الحقوق علينا ولكل من علمنا في دينك حرفا يا رب العالمين وصلى اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين